host, Sherry Hudson Passy from Carolina Girl Genealogy. And as usual, these fabulous people have joined me tonight on this panel. We've got Laura Hedgecock, Treasure Chest of Memories. Hi, Laura. Hi, nice to be here. So good to have you here. We've got Dan Earl, our family history guy. Hey, Dan. Hello. We have Mary Kircherati from MKR Genealogy. Hi, Mary. Yeah. With her beautiful quilt in the background. I always have to mention your quilt. <laughs> <laughs> we have Shelly Murphy, who's our family tree girl. Hi, Shelly. Hi. Thanks good evening, being, everyone. Thanks for being here. And last but certainly not least, we've got Melissa Barker, our archive lady. Hi, Melissa. Hello. So great to be here. From a snowy, cold Tennessee. Yes. <laughs> And can I mention that my blog is a genealogist in the archives? That's right. Please do that. A genealogist awesome. in the archives. Fabulous blog. And we have a special guest tonight, all the way from Canada. <laughs> we have Max Golden, who is coming on to talk to us about so many, so many things that she's involved in. So, you know, DNA, wiki tree, there's so much. So we are so excited to have you here. And um for those of you who follow her and her um, business, it is grandma's jeans, which I think is so cute. Oh, <laughs> but not the kind of jeans that, you know, some of us may be wearing, but <laughs> the DNA kind of jeans. So um, Max, what got you started in genealogy and especially genetic genealogy? Well, I, and I can blame it on the same person. Uh, the and, and thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited because I love all of these people. They're they're great people, and I'm a big fan of of lots of people and Dan and Shelley and you. of course you. Um, my grandmother. I promise you that when I was born, my mother's mother caught me in the birthing room and started shouting, your grandfather is Thomas Cleland Hunt. Your great grandfather was, and I promise you that she did that. And I spent my entire life on her knee looking at scrapbooks and information about her family. She was a Dillard from Dillard, Georgia. Um, and she was very, very, incredible. I, I, I have never found very much stuff that she ever wrote down about her family, but she could tell you mm -hmm. every single relationship to the nth degree. Um, and come to find out when she was a child, she was actually sent away oh, and wow. grew up. Okay. I'm going to tell you a creepy story. You ready for this? Sure. So, <laughs> Dad, Dan is very excited about the creepy story. There you go. In 1983, I was getting ready to graduate, and I lived in Columbia, was going to school in Columbia, and my grandparents came down and said, you know, we want to take you, well, they called and said, we want to take you out to a really nice restaurant in Columbia to celebrate your university graduation. I was like, okay, cool. Uh, so, they said to pick a restaurant because they don't live in Columbia. So, I picked this restaurant in this old house on Senate Street. And we go um, to this restaurant. We, we, I noticed that there's a little conversation going on between my grandparents. I don't know what it's about. So we're sitting there. We're having this wonderful meal. And my grandmother, who had a lung problem with uh, lung cancer when she was in the 60s. So they removed one of her lungs and her vocal cord stretched. So I always talk in her voice. And she looks over me out the set of windows behind me in this restaurant and says, I used to watch the children out there in the garden. Now, I, I looked at her like she was having a stroke. I didn't know what was going on. It was crazy. I looked at my grandfather. My grandfather is turning red. I'm like, what on earth is going on? And then we go back to eating. Uh, T, my grandfather, TC, changed the, changed the whole thing. We go back to eating, and a little while later, she says, and I used to play the piano in the parlor there. So when the children came, uh, the families came to pick the children that they wanted to take home, there would be happy music playing. <laughs> okay, so I look at her again, <laughs> thinking there's something really wrong. I look at my grandmother. My grandmother says, I'm going to go to the bathroom. She gets up and she leaves the table. I don't want to ask my grandfather a word. He goes to check on her. They come back. They sit down. We leave the restaurant and on the way back to take me back to my dorm, they drive through this, this set of little duplexes and they stop in front of it. And she said, well, I used to hang out here a lot with 
and she called her aunt something. And I'm like, why is she telling me all this? But that's really interesting. Come to find out after she passes away, she has done an interview with my sister probably three months before this. And she must have thought that my sister and I talked to each other, which we had not. But she sends us these CDs of interviews she did with my grandparents. And apparently my grandmother was sent away to a children's home in Columbia that was supposedly family. I've not found any connection. She lived in this home and she played the piano in this home. And it was a children's home for mill children who their families couldn't take care of them. And they were giving, it's not a legal home. I haven't found any legal information about it. There's no children listed as living there, not even my grandmother. Um, and her best friend there was a woman who was a former slave of this family because they treated my grandmother kind of like a servant in the house. And so the only two servants in the house were my grandmother and this former enslaved person. And I have pictures of this, this woman that my grandmother has, and I have stories about her. And her family is actually an ancestor. I've been trying to contact them. But the funny thing is, the weird, creepy thing is, I have a picture of my grandmother standing in the yard of the old house that, that they lived in. And it was the house that we had lunch in that day. Oh, my God. Wow. Oh, so she knew what she was talking I about. I love that she knew. <laughs> I had no idea. And can you imagine... Can you no. imagine? My my sister didn't send us those CDs till 20 years after they had passed. Oh, why not? Because <laughs> she was trying to protect them. I mean, my, uh, in, in the recordings, my grandfather says, should I be telling this kind of information on this um, recording? So come to find out, she had this three ring binder and she had been writing her name L-O-Y-D, Lloyd. Mm -hmm. And her real name was Lord. Um, and it turns out that her father was a bigamist. The family was supposedly split up and sent away. But the cousins that I've talked to said that my grandmother was not a part of the family and that she was the only one sent away, which is why I got a DNA test. Told you a long story to tell you the two. <laughs> I reasons. love it. I do oh, too. That's love fascinating. It. Uh -huh. <laughs> Melissa, you had a you had a question about some records. Or had one too. Oh, um, she was talking about the, the orphanage and saying that no official records and she said it was a mill orphanage. And I just wondered if possibly it was owned by the mill and maybe if there are any records surviving from the mill that they would have something. There were lots of mills uh, in mm -hmm. that area. My uh, great grandmother, uh, my grandmother's mother worked in a mill in Atlanta when my grandmother was sent away. Um, so there were lots of family uh, groups that were in the mills around that area. These people were evangelical Christians as part, far as I can see. They were connected with the, uh, I got to remember the name of it. The, um, it was an uh, Elida, the Elida community in Asheville, North Carolina, which was a home oh. for unwed mothers. Hmm. Okay. So the picture that I have of my grandmother outside of the uh, home, she's pregnant in the picture. Uh -huh. And I've been trying to figure out, I I'm going to be giving a talk for Legacy Family Tree webinars in, when is that? In June, June the 2nd at 2 p.m., where I'm going to talk about her story. It's a mitochondrial Ooh. DNA talk. And I'm going to show some of these pictures. But um, she looks pregnant in the picture. And I actually went into the genealogy squad and had the genealogy squad help me identify a date for this. And wow. so I did a whole graph based on the answers that I got from there. And they all guessed a date that would have been before their first child was born. Wow in 1931 so it's interesting it's it's a very interesting story way more than the stuff i've told you lots of children <laughs> laura i'm sorry you had a question no she kind of answered it because i was curious where all this was but then you said you were in columbia having the meal and that's where the right. house was uh, and you mean columbia um, south carolina right, right. yeah <laughs> yeah because you're right there's so many mills through south carolina and yeah. the mill towns a lot of times yeah, yeah. 
So, I have tried. I've tried going back and looking for mills. Uh, and I think that these people were just being uh, eleemosynary. They were trying to give back to the community by trying to help these families out with by taking these children that they couldn't afford. Or mm -hmm. maybe there was alcoholism, which was very rampant in the mill villages. You know, I don't know what the reason was, but for some reason they had kids. They didn't live with them, but the, huh. I think that they just sent them up. So, you know. Huh. Interesting. Shelly, you had a question? Yeah, I was wondering if your grandmother was the youngest child, but also what age was she sent away? Well, I, I don't want to give away the whole story. Oh, well, don't tell it. I'll <laughs> um, watch on this. June I don't know for sure. I know that she was in Columbia in, for sure in 1923. She was in Atlanta in 1910. So sometime between, and her brother was born in 1912. So the family was still together in 1912 mm -hmm. uh, and they were living in Anderson, South Carolina. And then when the family split up, her mother went to live with um, family near her sister in Atlanta. So I won't ask anymore because <laughs> I'll wait for June 2nd. <laughs> exactly. yeah, could you um send us all a reminder please yes this <laughs> yeah is a good, good teaser for your <laughs> yeah yeah i'm gonna go book it when we get done so i'll make June sure second make... at uh 2 p.m okay right. yep on the wednesday right. probably yep right. yep i got questions though <laughs> <laughs> We've all got i know questions. me too i think mary had a question well i just i <laughs> Um, I'm just curious, your grandmother said a couple different things in that lunch. Where was your, what? what? <laughs> tell me more. Oh, we, you no. can't tell. Here, That's here is a quote. <laughs> here is a quote from my grandmother. We don't do that in our family. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. 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 This is lot, your right? maternal <laughs> or your paternal grandmother. My, my maternal grandmother. So I got a mitochondrial DNA to start mm -hmm. with back in 2014. Oh, and, wow. I, and there's more to the story, but I actually mm -hmm. have been able to identify a person who lived in the same county she lived in, in, in the same time frame, who is a zero distance match and carries the same surname as her married surname. Oh. So mm -hmm. I, I have the lightning bolt of mitochondria. <laughs> and have I had an opportunity? The cobbler's children have no shoes. Yes, so absolutely. We don't have time to work on our own family. But exactly. as a good excuse, I have this webinar coming up in June that I really need to get some research <laughs> done. So I'm That's excited great. about that. That is great. Yeah, I'm very excited yeah. about it. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about this DNA. Tell me about your um, what do you what's it called? The mitro, yeah, the mitro Y DNA. I wanted to say it correctly. So mito Y DNA. Mito Y DNA. Well, tell us about that and how you got started with it and what's it all about. Well, obviously, I have uh, an affinity to working with mitochondrial DNA and Y DNA because it was very important to me to prove my grandmother's connection to the family that she grew up thinking that she was a part of. And then these cousins telling me that she wasn't really a child of that family. I have proven that she is absolutely a Dillard and a Lord and all of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but Back when I did it, there were two websites that were av available free to the genealogy community, and they were run by, by Family Tree DNA. They were called Y-Search and MitoSearch, one for Y-DNA and one for mito mitochondrial DNA. I worked with those two sites specifically and made huge discoveries on both sites, one for my mitochondrial and one for my Y. Huge for my Y-DNA. I discovered the root of my surname which was incredible. So I knew how important these two sites were to the community. In 2017, prior to um, MitoSearch and Y-Search being shut down, I approached Bennett Greenspan at Family Tree DNA and mm -hmm. told him that I wanted to create a nonprofit corporation and that I would like to take over those two databases from Family Tree DNA. Uh, he nice. said no, politely. <laughs> um, and uh, so I walked out of that me meeting, literally walked out of the meeting with Bennett and started 
getting a team together to build our own mm -hmm. database because I knew how important having a why mm -hmm. in mitochondrial DNA database that's accessible to people. And I know how important that was. Uh, so that's what we're doing. We're, we're building a new why in mitochondrial DNA database that's crowdsourced, free, and accessible to the community. It is completely community supported, both financially, uh, through programming, we have people volunteering and giving us information. Like we have people who have why and mitochondrial DNA tools that are, are out there floating in the world. Well, we're consolidating a lot of those tools and putting them on mitoI DNA so that they're available. So Ann Turner has a tool for determining your most recent common ancestors. And she gave us that tool and we've reworked the tool and made it so people can actually use it uh, in the past, she had just had an executable file that you could put on your computer and run. And what we've done is we've created a web version of it for Ann Turner's tool. So we're building tools based on community input. Um, we've got every single person in our team is a volunteer. Uh, we have Rob Worthen, myself, uh, Kevin Borland. Um, everybody knows Leanne Kruger. Um, mm -hmm. We've got mm -hmm. uh, Greg Clark. Um, Gail French, uh, and uh, we've just added Michelle um, Michelle Jones as our social media and uh, marketing coordinator. So we're slowly getting ourselves out there and we're building. We have been building consistently over time, just mm -hmm. constantly. So, yeah. Well, I see too that there's a Chrome extension. Yes. Tell me about uh, that. The Chrome extension is to gather mitochondrial DNA because that's a hard one to gather. So we just created a Chrome extension. But basically for Y or mitochondrial DNA, you just, you grab your uh, STR results from the company you've tested with, which we, we take every possible historic DNA test. One of the first manually input DNA tests we put into the system was a Sorensen test. So we can take Sorensen, we can take the historic ancestry test back when ancestry actually did Y in oh. mitochondrial DNA testing. So if somebody has the results from that, we can take that. Wow. We can take Nat Geo one, which you can no longer get anymore. We can we mm -hmm. we can take Oxford ancestors. So every single possible Y in mitochondrial DNA test that ever was, mm -hmm. whatever is present. So currently it's just Y seq and family tree DNA. Huh. Uh, and anything testing why and mitochondrial DNA testing that might come in the future. Uh, we've been approached by a couple of whole genome sequencing companies to uh, get their information into our system. So we'll be extracting the why and the mitochondrial from those whole genome sequences so people will be able to do that. There's so much that we can do that we're just slowly working our way into that. The, the more money we get, we've just passed a huge um, financial threshold. We said we needed so many dollars in the bank so that we could keep ourselves going from year mm -hmm. to year. And we mm -hmm. just, just crossed that oh, by getting a grant from, yeah, by getting a grant from, uh, the latest grant was from the Ottawa, uh, Ontario Genealogical Society's Ottawa branch gave mm -hmm. us uh, a, a, a branch and the, uh, the uh, Purdy Trust has given us a big grant. They gave us two grants two years in a row. We got one of uh, Megan Schmolniak's great grants. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've also gotten, we're getting contributions. Those, those users giving those contributions uh, once a month, like a, a dollar or $5 a month will, will keep us going. Well, as usual, we will add all those links to the post so yeah. that people can, can get on, learn more about it and, and contribute. So, so I have questions. Yes, I was just going to say, Laura has <laughs> questions. <laughs> because I, I think the, my personal opinion is, is the, the DNA groups in our industry have introduced their own disruptive force in the industry. Yes, they have. And I was, and so I think there's a lot of fear now that terms of service, will, services will be changed and people <laughs> are at a point where they're kind of reluctant to trust people. So right. how are you guys different and how are you combating that? And anything you wanna say in that realm? Yeah, um, there's not much we can do with the destructive forces. Unfortunately, there are unprofessional and destructive forces in genetic genealogy. And what we're doing is we're providing a service to the community. 
Uh, that service is based on a terms of service agreement that says if you are uploading to this site, you are either the person that you're the person who tested or you have a written permission from them or some sort of beneficiary form that you can upload. And before you can upload anything to the site, you have to opt in for every possible alternative. So we allow academic research. So we have um, uh, kits that have been uploaded from ar archaeological digs. Mm, you, can, wow. you can compare yourself to Richard III or Zara Nicholas um, wow. or any of the, the, the women in those families, but also more. Um, we're getting ready to take in a secondary um, database that's been offered to us that's going to allow us to have a lot more academic. We allow medical research in the terms of if somebody wants to investigate uh, family groups who have handed down mitochondrial diseases, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, people who are doing re medical research on that kind of information about those specific kinds of, of um mitochondrial or specific male-to-male -male, uh, inherited diseases. We allow that. Uh, we also allow law enforcement research on our site. And you have to say when you upload each one of your kits, if you want to opt into those possibilities. So you will not be seen by any law enforcement kits that are uploaded to our site unless you check that you want to be seen by them. You won't be seen by any medical research unless you check you want to be seen by them or any academic research unless you want to be seen by them. So, so we're very careful about that. Mm -hmm. And our terms of service are very plain. If you upload to our site, you are saying that you want to share this DNA information. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of we've kind of done it backwards from everybody else is in that we're saying this is a shared site and if you're here you're agreeing to sharing everything. And I know that one of the big questions in genetic genealogy is that when I share my information it means I'm also sharing all these other testers. Yeah. But the, the thing on our site is, is that every single kid on our site is being uploaded with some by somebody who has permission to upload that kit or it's a kit for them or a kit for a deceased person. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you're saying, oh no, you're gonna, you're gonna, because I can see your matches, I'm seeing all of these other people. Well, all of these other people have also opted into that sharing as well, so. Okay, and you figured out financially how much it's going to take you to keep going. Have you figured out how many kits have to be uploaded for this to be a meaningful genealogical resource? Oh, good well, question. It's a great I, I question. Think that, um, I think that the uh, Y search and minus search had 70,000. I'm not really sure on that number, but it was, it was somewhere up in the 70,000s. Um, we're starting slow. We're being, uh, we're being not we're being slow on purpose. We're growing ourselves, we're growing our tools, we're growing our, our um, database in the, in the, in this, we're trying to keep things even so that we grow financially, that we grow in our user input and volunteer support. We're growing, uh, we're trying to do everything kind of equally. So we're, we're growing in kits and we're growing in all the support we need as well. Uh, and we, we kind of feel like it's an organic thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have never gone uh, backwards on a month. Uh, we've, only, we've only gone forward. And the other thing is, is um, it's all user input information. So if you upload inaccurate information or incorrect information, then you're going to have incorrect information available sure. on the site. Like yeah. people mess up their haplogroups all the time, mm -hmm. but the haplogroup is something that is user reported. Um, so we, we had a question last week about uh, there being a problem with haplogroups. And I'm like, well, that's, that's probably the user that, that uploaded that. So we give people the opportunity to email the other users and say, hey, we've got a haplogroup problem. You're a YDNA match to me and we don't have the same haplogroups. A, B, people also don't understand the hierarchy of how haplogroups fall within the phylo tree or the phylo tree. Um, what was I going to say? There was another thing I was going to mention uh, about people uploading. Um, anyway, well, I'll figure it out and come back to it. But yeah, so I think that, that we're addressing 
you know, the ability to have things in the system and moving at a slow pace and building, we want to do it right. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's our mantra. Uh, at our monthly meetings, we say we're doing DNA right. Every time we end a meeting, we're doing mm -hmm. DNA right. I like that. Yeah. Speaking of doing DNA right, you wanted to show a couple of slides. I do. I do. <laughs> And, and I think it's something that'll make, make everybody happy. Um, knowing who, who I'm talking to, it's all people that I respect. And we all believe in doing good sources. So I'm gonna share just my like slides. Okay. Uh, let me get the right one, there we go. So uh, this is uh, the slide, uh, this is from a uh, talk that I did on surname projects and DNA projects. And uh, the fact that we don't have a place for the DNA projects now since GDPR happened, but Wikitree is a good place to set up the pedigrees and information for your DNA project. So that's what this was, surnames and DNA projects. And this was actually done for Legacy Family Tree webinars mm -hmm. this past year. But sourcing DNA, a lot of people talk about DNA and how to do it. Well, I want to do an autosomal test or a Y test or a mitochondrial test. And they talk about how these tests are integrated or, or how to find your matches and how to work on those matches and what a cinnamorgan means. Or they talk about all of this stuff, but you don't hear a lot of people giving presentations who talk about how to source DNA. And just like genealogy, we have to be able to talk about our sources. We have to be able to give the proof of the information that we're putting forward. And we have to have a way for people to go back to verify information. Mm -hmm. uh, so genealogy, this is kind of what, uh, I think this is my grandfather's, uh, some of the sources for him. Uh, yeah, I, and, if you would click on, um, to make it bigger, can you click on, um to show your presentation. So we're seeing your presentation and not just the slides on the side. Yeah, That's I need to thinking. shift things around. Really. Yeah. So I'm gonna... There you go. There. I gotta bring it up. Don't worry. Yeah. That's okay. <clears throat> we'll wait. <laughs> now we're gonna see all of our faces. There we go. There we go. And that's okay. Ah, there you go. Perfect. And we don't want the uh, captions. There we go. <laughs> so cute. this is what we would look like if we were if if we were looking at genealogy sources. And everything needs to be sourced. We need to go back and be able to proof it. Mm -hmm. For a DNA test, you need to be able to show that the information you have is correct. Um, so for this one, this is a Y DNA confirmation between my father. And two other DNA testers, whom I'm only calling anonymous because mm -hmm. we're not sharing their name. Right. But the kit number doesn't identify anybody, but that's obviously a made-up kit number anyway. So you'd have to give some things for that for that test. So you'd have to say the kit number. You'd have to say what the genetic distance is, what kind of test it was. It's a 37 test, a 37 marker test, and you have to list all three people who have tested. And you have to have three people who are a part of the same stool, but from different legs of the stool. And I'm going to show right. you that in just a second. And uh, also you can use FTDNA tips to show the percentage of accuracy in eight generations that a common ancestor would happen. And this, this actually uh, does go back to exactly eight generations, uh, but a 97.14% for 12 generations. Uh, and I've actually done the work and I've verified each one of their relationship trails mm -hmm. back. Um, you can also, this is a DNA, a sample DNA source citation. And Wikitree actually has really good pages on how to do uh, DNA source information. Um, I have another slide that I can show you. And we'll go back to that. And let me close that one out. I have to actually switch presentations here real <laughs> quick and uh, this is from a slide show uh, a presentation about uh, an African Canadian family history mystery and I'm going to be giving this talk <laughs> on um, 
let me look at my dates here. Uh, April the 16th at 2 p.m. for Legacy right. Family Webinars. And this is about a, an enslaved family uh, that lived in the Port Hope area of Ontario. Uh, so we have a DNA tester, and then we have okay, two- We're not seeing your screen yet. So are you, oh, are you showing sorry. the screen? That's okay. I just want to make sure that you knew that we didn't see it yet. But you may not have wanted to show it yet. So. <laughs> I did. There we go. There we go. So this is from that uh, slide deck from that. Mm -hmm. We have a DNA tester who was the client who, uh, and what my goal was, was to identify if uh, this, uh, if his family was related to the Huffman families, if his real last name was, was Huffman. And I was able to do that just by getting the Y DNA test. But I went further and I actually found out what family it was. And it goes back to these, um, this family of uh, former enslaved people, the Huffmans. I have these two descendants uh, and also the, uh, the uh, tester, the, the client. And to do a triangulation, what I used for them was beyond the Y test. I didn't have another Y tester and I, I couldn't find someone who wanted to do a Y test for us, but they all did autosomal tests. Uh, and I was able to connect him with nine cinnamorgans, which is very small percent, uh, mm -hmm. small shared segment. On chromosome 16, you have to tell the actual location that this start and end point was for the overlaps of all these people, Ron Ferguson and Elanon shared with E. Huffman. They all were on the same chromosome from this distance to this st distance and using ISOG standards. And they all go back to the most common recent ancestor of Peter Huffman. And I said just a second ago, you had to have three right. different legs of the stool. So if we, if we create a leg of the stools, instead of showing this triangulation in a triangle, we can show that Elanon reaches Peter Huffman through this son, Abraham. Our client, E. Huffman, reaches this Peter Huffman through Robert, who was uh, his great, uh, the son. And then there's another son, John, that Ron A. Ferguson actually goes to. And I can say Ron's name because he's given permission for that. Um, so we have the three legs of the triangulation back to Peter Huffman. And that just goes to show you in a different way. And sometimes when you're talking triangulation to people or writing a, a citation based on this, you have to show them the stool. And this is what the confirmation citation looks like for this triangulated uh, segment. It lists the three people. It tells you where we did the triangulation, which was on GEDmatch. And it gives the information for each one of those kits on GEDmatch and the amount of shared cinnamorgans on the specific uh, segment of chromosome 16. So you have to be able to do a citation. Yeah. That's so that's, that is it. <laughs> I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, based on like you're talking about the triangulation and things like that. Is it possible that if I took like, say I get a bunch of DNA matches and and so I start recording them by the chromosomes. Right. Just make me a table, Excel spreadsheet, and and start taking and putting their name and this, that, and other so I know who they are, but start logging them by chromosome. Do right. I need to have the measurement? Is that vital for me? It is absolutely Not a DNA vital person, but <laughs> for for that to happen. Because I just go hire somebody. Right. <laughs> it, that is that is absolutely vital to do. Yeah. Um, okay. So that I should put that distance. Because yeah. I thought about it. Because like I know some that are mama side, some that are daddy side, but I'd like to be able to fine tune that. And and I'm simple. Mm -hmm. I like simple tables. I don't want the big fancy stuff. But I, I have an easy one for you. Um, if you've ever heard of Dana Leeds, Leeds, uh, she did a, a lead method. Yeah. yeah, the Leeds yeah. method. She actually has a version of it called the Collins Lead method that that DNA Jedcom hosts. Um, but she actually did something that was earth shaking, earth shattering. And I actually asked her last year 
um, how she felt being someone who made such a huge impact mm -hmm. on genetic genealogy. And she was kind of like, well, I've never really thought of it like that. She's <laughs> humble. She's such a great person. Mm -hmm. um, she created uh, the Leeds Method. And what the Leeds Method does is it, it, you go through each one of your matches and you identify all the people you have in common with that match. And if you know who that match is and how they fit in your family, you know that it fits a specific family group. Mm -hmm. And so you give them a color for that specific family group. And you go on to your next in common matches. And if you have that same person on the first one, they're going to all be in that same color group. So in the end, you're going to end up with four basic color groups for mm -hmm. your, like back to your second cousin. Okay. So you're going to know who that is. You can take it even deeper and you can have multiple colors for multiple different groups for multiple sets of grandparents <laughs> going back and back and back. So she created this and that's what all of the DNA clustering tools are based mm -hmm. on is her. Wow. Okay. So what I always suggest to people to do, and I'm going to tell you to do this too, Shelly, is go through and work the leads method. It is not hard to do. It is time consuming while you're doing it. But once you get to the point where you just upload your DNA to GEDCOM or GEDmatch and you have GEDmatch run a cluster for you, you'll the clusters will make sense to you. So the hardest part about the clustering programs is they don't identify who the family groups are, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. So you have to be able to know how to do the leads method to be able to figure that out. And so I just tell people to do the leads method and then upload a GEDCOM to DNA GEDCOM and use the Collins leads method tool and, and see how that, that flushes out for you. So there, yeah. that's my answer for you. Because my biggest thing is always, is it mama's side or daddy's side? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the leads method is a perfect way, and okay. that's called phasing. It's the yes. perfect way to that. phase your yeah. kits mm -hmm. into maternal and paternal. And don't be confused by the words paternal and maternal, because we also use in genetic genealogy the word matrilineal or patrilineal, which is only the father's 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 mm -hmm. father's mm -hmm. father's mm -hmm. line, whereas mama, paternal mama, mama. is everybody on your dad's side. Yeah, yeah. Mary got said she's got a question. Yeah, so, thank you. Um, my, you're talking about triangulation right. on, on a lot of this. And right. When you are strictly working with ancestry matches and you can't get people to upload for whatever reasons, right. you're basically having to work just using shared matches and you can't technically triangulate on a, a given segment. You but can if you download the information from ancestry and upload it to GEDmatch. Right. And, you but, can but you have to get permission to do that. And That's if you true. Can't get That's permission, true, right. To, to for, for people to and they basically have to do that in many instances yeah uh, if know, it's a client you're working with and call. you've got the client yeah yeah um or or you find you have a bunch of matches on ancestry and you know that there is a connection it's difficult to approach a mm -hmm. lot of people who just tested for you know kilter right. leader hosing question yeah <laughs> to them, to move forward Absolutely. yeah um, but you can see that these people connect and, and so you get a whole bunch of people um, and they connect. And, and so you can, and the odds with multiple children from one ancestral couple um, connecting any other way, because, you know, they all marry different spouses. So it, the only way you get to a point where the, really the only logical way that there can be the connection has to be through that ancestral couple. Right. Um, but... However, there's a butt in there, Mary. <laughs> but, however, I heard that <laughs> there, there's a there's a client that I'm working for right now that I've been putting off calling her because I have to call her and give her some really bad news. Mm -hmm. um, her mother passed away right before her original birth certificate arrived. Her dying wish was to know who she was. Oh. So she passed away not being able to see that piece of paper. Well, this client gave me the piece of paper and said, I want to know who these people are. And I had to go back to her and tell her that they were made up. Oh. The people on the birth certificate, I've actually gone back and reconstructed oh. how the mother of her uh, mother came up with the name for the father. It's in a 1915 Toronto um, 
directory, city directory. William is from the first column. Mm -hmm. Jarvis is on the same line in the second column. And Luckhurst is on the third column as a surname. Oh my God. Oh, wow. I, I How did you figure that out? It was, <laughs> That's a whole other program. It was, it, was, <laughs> yeah, it was after many, 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 many months of trying to find these two people who were supposedly married on Valentine's Day mm -hmm. in London, England. And these were their names. And there were no, there's no people in all of England, nobody in Ireland, nobody in Scotland with those names who got married mm -hmm. on February the 14th. There was no uh, immigration record for anybody like that ending up. Mm -hmm. So I've done the research. I've actually found the father's family for this, uh, this person. Um, we're having trouble because the family is not connected to each other. We're having trouble getting more DNA testers. Mm -hmm. but we have it narrowed down to three men who all worked in the same trade, who all work on the same projects, that were all in the same area in Toronto. But the, the bad thing is, is that every single one of her DNA matches come back to that same family. Oh. There are there are no maternal or matrilineal lines that do not go back to that family. Oh. So this client, this is what I've been putting off calling. I have to call her and talk to her because I can't do any more work for her because there is some sort of horribly incestuous mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. happening mm. and no wonder the mother went to such hard work to try and hide the real truth about this birth oh goodness oh goodness well, yeah so well, on that note let's move into something a little bit happier yes <laughs> talk a little bit about wiki tree before my point, yes, my point yes. is my point is is the that the information has to be right you have to be able to find all of that collateral stuff. And I can tell you a lot of the matches that we had that we thought were the mother's line yeah. have taken a year's worth of research to take them back to that family. Right. You right. wouldn't believe the research that's gone into this. So, oh, Well, I know. I think, Melissa, did, didn't you have some questions about WikiTree that you wanted to talk to Max about? Oh, well, I was excited that Max was going to talk about WikiTree because um, <laughs> uh, and the programming that they're actually doing right now and doing this, I guess, this entire year. But I'll just let Max talk about <laughs> yeah, the, the programming that you're talking about is the WikiTree Challenge. And what they are doing is oh. they are, uh, it's, it's the year of accuracy. And if you don't know anything about WikiTree, WikiTree is all about accuracy. And some people get really turned off because people add sources or information to profiles. But WikiTree is a collaborative thing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of different people could be working on the same profiles together and adding information and updating sources. And uh, there's a source-a-thon every year where mm -hmm. we don't do anything for 72 hours, <laughs> but uh, eat chocolate, drink Pepsi or coffee and stay up for 72 hours doing nothing but sourcing profiles that are already on WikiTree that don't have sources. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. Well, WikiTree is also all about the collaborative work. And I think Melissa has been reached out to, and uh, Henry Louis Gates was one of the people last week. Judy Russell's being done this week. And if you know Judy Russell, she's done a lot of research on her family. So mm -hmm. What WikiTree is doing is they're, they're taking these people who are, are, are famous genetic genealogists, famous genealogists, fam famous hobbyist genealogists, and they're actually working on their family tree on WikiTree uh, and working on things that, that other people haven't had time to work on. Mm -hmm. Now, Judy Russell has so much good work that yeah. she's very skeptical that WikiTree will find anything. <laughs> well, I already know that they have found some stuff for Judy Russell. <laughs> Oh, very nice. Yeah. I've got to miss the great great grandfather. So I'm hoping that that when he comes to be my week, I think it's in April, May. Ooh. I hope, hope you'll find him for me. <laughs> <laughs> so Wait, they're, they're so working is on this people that didn't have their information on WikiTree yet. Um, some people have some information on WikiTree. Like I'm not eligible because I use WikiTree as my main genealog genealogy platform. So I'm not eligible, which is heartbreaking because I have lots of stuff I'd still like. <laughs> they need to find out that matrilineal thing. Um, so they're, they're working oh, but on- I have like 80% of mine on there, but it is not my primary. No. 
No, no mine's no. about fifty, and it's not my primary. So yeah. you guys want to get get in on the the action? Yeah, that's why I'm going with this. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you put in a good word for the them? Tears. <laughs> so the the whole idea behind this this fifty two week challenge is every week or 50, 49 weeks. I don't think they're going to do it on Christmas week. Uh, they're going to try and identify parts of families for these. Uh, famous or not so famous or hobbyist genealogists and they're going to work their information on WikiTree and show how collaborative genealogy works which is mm -hmm. really incredible if you saw Henry Louis Gates you can go to the WikiTree YouTube channel and see that was amazing the recordings uh, he is so cool uh, and they actually found information for Henry Louis Gates that uh, mm -hmm. that his professional genealogist had not found for him in the past. So, so cool. that was a lot of fun. Go so. watch it, but I'll just say this, that, that in the in the middle of him telling what they have found, he said, wait, 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 wait. I have to go get my wife. And he calls upstairs to get his <laughs> wife to come down there. So it's amazing. I'm going to watch it as soon as we get the very beginning, the beginning to go get a glass of red yes, wine. Yes, and he got a glass of red wine. Oh, uh, my question, though, about and it's not particularly about WikiTree. It's about any of these um, websites. I'm not going to name the others that are collaborative. Right. Um, I am like you, Megs, before we started taping, you talked about freely disseminating your family information. And I am all about that. My, my bulk of my trees are on Ancestry. They've never been private. They've always been open to anyone and everyone. However, I'm in control of those trees. Yep. And exactly. one of my questions is, is that there, you know, and you hear the horror stories of people that have stuff has been put on their trees that can't get it taken off. It's wrong information. They have documentation. I think that's what scares some people away. So what would you tell someone mm -hmm. that that's kind of scary for them? So WikiTree started out as a global family tree. And the, from the onset, um, Chris Witten wanted to do something to introduce his soon to be wife to his family. And so he started designing this, this thing. And he was uh, already huge into wiki uh, type programs. So he created this tree as a, as a global family tree. He wanted all of his cousins to come and work and it just grew and grew and grew. And there's, there's millions and millions of wiki treers now mm -hmm. uh, and millions and millions and millions of profiles. So what you do as a person, like I manage my profile and I manage a lot of my family profiles. And as a profile manager, I know when somebody's doing work on a profile. And as a collaborative genealogist, if I want to do work on, on a profile that someone else manages, I leave a note on the profile and I say, hey, I have some sources of information I'm going to add to this information. There is a changes uh, tab that you can go through and see all of the changes that have been done ever to a single uh, uh, profile. And you can actually revert some of those changes. If the changes weren't correct, you can revert them back to the way they were before they were changed. So there is that ability. But the, the biggest thing about a collaborative tree and about WikiTree is it is a community and it is collaborative and you have to learn how to communicate with people about what you're doing. Um, uh, if you have a disagreement about a source, um, it's not you or somebody else that's going to decide what that source is. We're going to we're going to actually look at the source to let it decide. So. If we know that there is a source um, that was found on one of my family lines that uh, was a part of uh, Gustave Anjou's great frauds, he he added a father to my earliest known uh, gateway ancestor to Virginia, who the guy that they said was the father of my Edmund Bacon, the, the guy actually has a will that says, I had no children. But oh. Gustav Anjou still connected him as the father to my Edmund Bacon. So there were wiki tree people that actually figured that out. And the way I was approached about cutting off 18 generations of my family was, hey, we have this and we want to show it to you. Let's talk about it. Let's put it up for the community. So we wrote a post about it, or, or he did, wrote a post about how this was a fraud and people in the community actually went through and found more sources and information. We talked about it in the, the genealogist to genealogist forum until we all came to a quorum about how the profile should be presented. And we plopped it into the profile and, and removed all the crap that was in there from Gustav Anjou. 
I, I could add to that because when I first started uploading, I did get people saying, oh, this needs something. And everything was super helpful. Like one profile, they're like, this is not the correct spelling at birth. And I'm like, I don't have a birth record. And she was like, well, honey, let me help you. <laughs> Here's what I found. Yeah. And so I had, you know, an additional record or if they believed a profile was already on Wikitree and it was duplicated, helping me research through it till I then began taking that role and somebody yeah. else yeah. would be doing that. So I found every as opposed to another collaborative site where it can just be gone the next day. Right. And, or and, there's a second wife and 14 new kids. Right. In right. another that state that happened simultaneously. <laughs> That's so what brought I, me to Wikitree was, was finding a huge mess like that. Go ahead, Laura, sorry. No, so I, I honestly, I find it's kind of the right solution for collaboration yet keeping some kind of accuracy and control right, right. it and, is and, cumbersome sometimes because you have oh, to yeah. work with other people yeah it's a group project always takes longer to do than a single project <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i think sometimes least, we have a hard time with that because genealogy is is really in a lot of ways a solitary thing right, right. And, and, and so when and it's kind of like you're coming coming into my family what are you doing yeah. <laughs> yeah, thing, that, but yeah that paradigm shift has happened in genealogy mm -hmm. we, we're not keeping our information close That's anymore. good though because Dan Earl's talking about it on on his podcast or 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 talking about it in his video cast mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, or or Sherry is talking about it or or Laura's putting it in her, her blog people are talking about our family trees so it's no yes. longer that hold in and WikiTree because it was set up as a global family tree to start with um, it is that family search is another global family tree and they were not set up as a global family tree to start with. Mm -hmm. And they're having to backtrack now to try and, and correct some of the stuff that had gone on in the past to merge those, those uh, ancestors together. And they're doing a great job, but there's a lot of catch up that needs mm -hmm. to happen for them to be in a good place with the collaborative tree. But they are, family search is doing the best job of doing that of, of all the trees. There are other trees that I won't mention where that isn't even a concept mm. and uh, stuff gets written over. But, but since WikiTree started out as a collaborative tree, they've really been able to hold to that and try to make it one profile per person who ever lived, you know, within yeah. reason. We don't go back to before Christ. You know, <laughs> it's, it's usually before paper records is kind of hard to do because yeah. that's not genealogy anymore. Okay. So yeah, we we work on we work on stuff together. It's fun. Max, it has been so much fun to have you on tonight. <laughs> we've it all has. Learned, we've all learned so much. Um, and you know everything we talked about, we will put um, links onto the blog post and uh, in our show notes so they can get to it. And just you're such a joy to talk to. Thank you. Oh, so thank you. Much. We I just, need a hug. Yeah, we have virtual <laughs> hug, everybody. <laughs> We're so glad that you came on from cold it, Canada like nobody else is living in the cold right now, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, we will say bye, and we'll see you next time on Gentlemen's. Bye. 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 bye.